ahead and get started with a uh, uh, motion or conversation around our August 2 agenda and July 22 minutes. Excuse me, could you have yes. us turn up the volume, please? That is as loud as it gets. Can I interrupt? Yeah. Wow, we're fine. Um, I'll make the motion that we approve the minutes and the agenda with no changes. Second. All right. <coughs> um, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. unanimously. All right, um, let's move on to our topic of why we are all here. Um, and just since I can't see everybody, let me make sure I know who all is in the space. I've got Kasha, Dan, Lincoln, and Stephanie as commissioners. Um, looks like we're missing Andrew, is that right? Okay, um, and then Alec and Cameron, I have listed as staff. And then I've got um, Stephen, Jay, and Patrick as members of the public. Is there anybody else? that I am missing here? I guess I'd be considered a member of the public. Bill Jolly. Bill Jolly is here for the public. Okay. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, all right, so um, just a little recap of where we ended things last time. Um, we essentially um, crossed off the list, the um, all of our parks except for Confluence, Peace, and Gateway, which are still potentially on the table. Um, Dan had shared a, a draft policy um, that would um, allow for camping in, um, it would allow for camping in those three parks and North Branch as well actually was how it had been drafted. Um, and we kind of tabled that till this discussion um, and since then, um, I know we've heard a little bit more from the public. I've been in touch with friends of the Winooski Vermont River Conservancy um, to get some insights from them, especially because these three parks are right along the river and, and have unique and different management concerns because of their location by the river. Um, so I think tonight, what I'd like to, to do is um, kind of starting with the, the draft that Dan had created um, when I attached it to the agenda for this meeting, based on our conversation last time, I took the liberty of crossing off North Branch because I think that in our conversation was kind of crossed off the list. Um, and so I want to talk about those three parks and then um, also any kind of um, mitigation or considerations that we would like to pass along to the city if camping is allowed in any of those three parks. Um, Yes, Dan. Yeah, I guess before we begin discussion, it would be nice to hear what the um, the friends and the River Conservancy said. And then I'd also like to hear from Cameron if there's been a new draft of the uh, of the city policy released or if we're still going off of the one that we had been looking at at our last meeting. Yeah, I think that um, that's great. Why don't I start with um, um, Friends of the Winooski and Vermont River Conservancy um, both of them, um, I think we had already identified their, um, a couple of their primary concerns of, um, human waste disposal, trash disposal, um, friends of the Wusnuski also brought up vegetation concerns and that, um, there has been camping at river access sites and parks in the past. And when that happens, um, the vegetation is sometimes, you know, cut down or cleared, uh, you know, if people are like moving it out of the way and when there's, um, increased impact and, and compression of the soils, um, it can result in, and, um, greater likelihood for erosion and things like that, that are of course not good for water quality. Um, our rivers are already struggling. Um, the, um, you know, based on simply our sewer systems that we have that are pretty antiquated and the way that we in general have treated our rivers for hundreds of years. Um, you know, the coli counts are already quite high um, beyond, you know, State Street, especially yeah, down to the confluence of the rivers and into the main branch of the Winooski. Um, 
so I think the vegetation concern I had, um, I had not heard so much before. And I think would, I think there are a couple of things there. One is like the impacts of like people walking on vegetation, clearing vegetation, um, compacting soils. Um, and then also, I think I've heard, um, we've heard from the public a couple of times mention of fire, um, and, um, which I think has, you know, obviously like safety risks to the community, but also very high vegetation risks because what are you going to burn except what is there? Um, so I think that's something that we haven't talked about, um, that I think we may want to, um, bring forward when we talk about like if camping is allowed in these places there shouldn't be fire and how to how to manage the um, vegetation rest um and then another piece that i think um is also um to think about is the permanence of the structures so for example um you know cameron has talked about this is not so much camping as sleeping and so, you know, what happens with people's things during the day? And as we've seen at like Girton Park, um, I think people leave belongings there and kind of use it as a hangout space all day long, right? So with something like Confluence Park, are we encouraging people potentially to like set up tents and tarps and kind of semi-permanent structures that are there day in and day out all the time and leave things? Or is this a sleeping space where people are, you know, coming and going, um, which I, th I think might be important to think about. You know, I just like to reiterate that, you know, and I don't think it's the city's intent to encourage any sort of outdoor camping. It, this is, this is a response to, you know, a potential emergency condition in that people that have been in hotels are potentially being released and not having any place to go. So I, the, I don't know, there are these keywords for me that I hear and yeah, they've been bandied about in, in the media and they've been bandied about elsewhere, but I just don't think it's the case. And encouragement is one of those words. I, you know, any vote that I take to allow um, encampments in the parks is not going to be me saying, I encourage you to, to camp here, or I encourage you to do this. It's going to be, you know, in response to an emergency condition, we are we are taking X action. Um, so I would prefer to not hear the word encourage um, in regards to what we're doing. Um, any dis discussion on that point? Lincoln, Stephanie? Um, I guess I, I appreciate that, but at the same time, I can't, I have a hard time separating allowing from encouraging. And I think, um, while it may be semantics of language, I think the effectively allowing camping is equal to encouraging camping. Um, I don't, I don't see in, in practice how those two things are separable, um, if, if you have a kid that wants to drive your car and they ask you to drive your car, you can allow them to drive your car, but are you encouraging them to drive your car? When you allow them to drive your car, yes, you are encouraging them to drive your car. <laughs> I don't see how you could conflate the two, but I, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to go into semantics here. Yeah. I just, the, I feel pretty strongly on this and I just don't think that the city is, is encouraging people to go out and camp. The city is, is being proactive and we are deciding whether or not we want to, you know, uh, add to the space that, you know, is potentially a part of this sort of non-intervention strategy or not. Um, there's no encouragement here that I can see. Um, the other piece of the um, VRC and Friends of the Winooski, I think we've also heard from the public, which um, is around simply the safety of the parks themselves and, and other users. And, um, you know, the Peace Park is, we had talked about, um, you know, it's along the, the rail trail bike path there. 
um, it is more hidden and kind of tucked away and I think could catch people by surprise, um, which they brought up as well. Um, so I think those were the main things, wildlife, trash, vegetation, and safety, um, and the temporal, like, you know, whether this is a, a permanent kind of allowance of day in and day out all the time, people can leave their things there or with whether there's some kind of temporal, um, you know, piece to the permission. Yeah, that, that last part, Kasha, I think that in my mind is like, you know, a big question mark. Like if the city does intend on regular monitoring, um, whether or not, you know, tents and sleeping areas can be set up, you know, invisible throughout the day, then to me, it does feel a little bit more like, yeah, encouragement, I guess, versus, you know, the, the allowing and monitoring of an emergency situation where we'd be, um, you know, making sure kind of people are staying camped in the areas that have been designated and within the times that have been designated. So, yeah, I'm curious to maybe talk more about that when it comes back around or um, in terms of our draft policy. Um, any other, I'm kind of um, sharing all this secondhand, obviously from VRC and Friends of the Winooski. Um, and um, any other questions on that piece or else Dan, I think you had a question for Cameron as well. On the, I think that if the policy had been amended, the city's policy had been amended or updated or anything since our last meeting. Hi, so uh, commissioners, thank you. This is Cameron Niedermeyer. Um, Dan, thanks for the question. Nothing formal has been put out yet. We've been working as staff to make edits based on the feedback we've gotten from y'all and further from the public and what our own um, response has been uh, in the interim time uh, where there is no policy. So um, we're working on edits and this was an important meeting for us to, um, to listen to before we put any other for any draft forward. So. Um, I think for the feedback I've gotten just offhand from different members of council is that this probably is a, because we've sort of put it forward as a two separate issues, like where can we create boundaries around uh, emergency sleep camping versus how to staff respond to these things are two separate sort of tracks. And so um, if no accord can be sort of come to between y'all and council and um, the cemetery commission will probably um, turn it to them to just say that this is, you know, the staff response versus the political side of it. And whatever y'all want to do with the political side of it will be separate than the staff response. Can, can you just clarify of the of the non park property that you've tentatively identified as sort of a non intervention zone. Um, are all those properties along a river or waterway. I think most of them. Because just the way it plays out most of our um, property is along waterways outside of the park system. Thank you. Any other questions on that? Thank you, Cameron. That was really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, so Cameron, uh, when you mean like turn over to the cemetery committee, what does that look like? What do you mean? You said um, if there's not a consensus between like the parks and the city. Oh, right. So, so you're an elected body, the cemetery commission is elected body, and the city council is elected body, which is why we wanted to get feedback from y'all about where parameters are. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, the cemetery commission didn't formally uh, endorse, but was okay with our list as presented to council last time. Council wanted to hear back from y'all and whatever y'all's um, suggestions may be, if you're taking it all off the table, then that's, you know, I don't know what, I can't speak for council, but might need to come at it at a different angle. Okay. Does that make sense? Just like as, and by that, I don't mean like we have to circumnavigate anything. I don't want there to be any misconstrued information here. 
just that staff still needs a response policy, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that has to be something separate that doesn't involve any new parameters around anything. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, so let's, let's start with the locations again, which I think there, when we closed last meeting, there were essentially, in, in my mind, three locations on the table Confluence, Gateway, and Peace. Um, do we want to still leave those locations on the table or having her, you know, talked with the community since then or heard any feedback, um, potentially remove any of those from the conversation? Uh, Kasha, yeah, yeah. It's, it sounded like um, that Peace Park might not be the best um, from it's probably the most well vegetated of those three sites, and it has you know the security concerns that you mentioned. Um, so maybe we start with talking more about that one based on the input that you got. Yeah. Thoughts on Peace Park? I mean, how how big of it's not that big of an area. Um, I think, and if we were to eliminate like Gateway, for example, I feel like that would have a huge impact on what we're talking about. Um, but Peace Park is a smaller, smaller park. And if, I don't know if there are a lot of, you know, stakeholder concerns about including that park in this plan, then I'd be open to revisiting whether it's appropriate to allow camping there. That, it, for me anyway, was where I kind of, my mind was going when I started to get feedback from others is that maybe Peace Park should not be on our list and that we should be talking about Confluence and Gateway. Any thoughts on that, um, Lincoln or Dan? I mean, if, if you lean towards removing Peace, then... I would go along with that, but I would also say if, if we're going to take out Peace Park, we should probably take out Confluence because it's just as small. And while it's not as, you know, the vegetation isn't well as, as well established, um, you know, the, the people that redid that wall along the river did a lot of work to remove invasives and we wouldn't want to see those um, be at risk of being reestablished or or reestablish themselves. So it really leaves this gateway. And I think the other piece for that you didn't mention there, Dan, for confluence is simply like a um, attraction of like a, I mean, it already is, but being a hangout day in, day out space where, where it's, there's some kind of permanence. Um, which I think for the long-term management of the park, that it's not, it's hardly even a park yet. It's like a little baby. It has not had time to like grow into the park that it could be. And I think if we start out by like using it in this way, I'm a little worried that like, it will just start the, um, you know, the pattern from the beginning that it's a, you know, a space specifically for this, which I'm, I don't, is surely not the intent of that park to begin with. You know, I've, I mean, since the, the concept of, con, of Confluence Park came about, I've, I've had that concern that, you know, regardless of what we do, that park is at risk of, of being a place where, um, you know, people, whether they're homeless or, or whether they're just vagrant, you know, I think there's always going to be that risk. And um, I don't know how to, to go about mitigating that, but um I, I wouldn't make my decision, well, me personally, I wouldn't make my decision based on that. I, you know, I would try to apply the same logic to all the parks. And, and I think the fact that it's a small space and it's not well vegetated and, um, you know, in my mind makes it, if we're going to choose to remove Peace Park from this, um, you know, these this list that we're making, then it makes sense to remove confluence. 
Blinken, do you have thoughts on um, either of those, peace or confluence? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I agree what's, with what's being said. And if it's just gateway that we're, you know, sort of, you know, agreeing to, I'd be just interested in like seeing what it is within our, you know, abilities to gather the resources and the facilities to like, I want to say encourage, but get it established and get it going as an option for people to emergency camp um, sooner rather than later. So it feels like we're, um, you know, although, you know, whittled down the original proposal to what makes sense for us also thinking about like the next steps and getting, getting the ball rolling with, with those who need to camp. Um, well, um, thanks Lincoln. I think that shifts us to gateway, which I think the question is essentially like with what mitigations in place, could this be possible? Um, and so I see Patrick, your hand, I'm think, um, if it's okay, I was just going to kind of get together basically like, um, you know, the draft mitigations and essentially what could be our proposal as a commission and then open it up for public comment, if that's okay. I can save you uh, a lot of work. The Gateway okay. Park is owned by the state of Vermont. Yeah, I'm sorry, um, Patrick. The park is uh, Patrick, he, Patrick is our, um, uh, he manages the um, cemetery and his staff and may have some information for you. Oh, great. I'm Thanks, sorry, Patrick. I should have introduced myself. Thanks, Cameron. No. Um, anyways, the uh, Gateway Park is owned by the state of Vermont, except for the portion that the parking lot is on, the upper parking lot that has the boulders around. Um, when we we developed the park, I don't know, maybe early 90s through a enhancement grant from transportation. And uh, we called it Gateway Park only because it was a gateway coming into Montpelier. Um, but the, the, the uh, so the parking lot's owned by the cemetery slash the city of Montpelier. The rest of it is state owned and then underneath the bridge, I believe, is a federal right-of-way. Um, so you, I don't believe you can even, you can go ahead and talk about letting people to camp there, but you don't have the right to do that. That's just like saying, go ahead and um, sleep or camp on the state house lawn. Um, that is interesting new information. So thank you, Patrick. You are perhaps saving us trouble. Um, I would like to hear from Dan and I think Alec also on that. Dan. You know, I guess that that's really useful information. And I guess it begs the question of, of whether it makes sense to even, and this might be directed more towards Cameron, but whether it makes sense to even have sort of this map of, of areas, because there's a lot of state land and you know, if, if a map seems to advocate or, or puts us at some sort of legal risk of running afoul with the state, um, then maybe we, sh we should just not have identified territories. So that way, you know, the city can make the choice of, of whether it wants to, you know, either encourage people to move if they're, you know, let's say they're next to a school or something, or or whether, you know, if, if they're trashing a site, then whether they're forced to move. Um, because there's a lot of state land. Um, we don't want to appear to encourage people to go to state land, but I also don't want to, you know, I don't want to discourage people, I, I guess. Uh, maybe that's a terrible way of saying it. Um, you know, I mean, if people want to camp on state land, then maybe the city should make the choice of, okay, let's let them camp on state land and, and the state can deal with it. And I don't know where, you know, if that puts us at any sort of legal risk, you know, if people want to camp behind the state house on that hillside and the city doesn't do anything about it, you know, even though the state gives us pilot payments and I don't know what the pilot payments entail for us. Um, there's, there's a whole lot of terrain and I think it doesn't, you know, if, if we just sort of leave it vague, is that going to put us at risk of running afoul of, of, you know, some other court in this district saying, well, based on what happened in district so-and-so, um, you you haven't done what you should do. Um, I, I, I guess, Cameron, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, um, yes. So I'm trying to frame up what I'm trying to say. So um I can't advocate one way or the other about state lands, nor can I make any sort of definitive statements about what 
is allowed and not allowed on state lands. But um, you're right, if there isn't any new boundaries drawn, um, it sort of reverts back to the general idea of what we were doing before, uh, but now with some, hopefully some staff rules in place to connect people to services. So, um, yeah, the map and the idea of this was to get ahead and be proactive, understanding that this probably is the, the way of the future, if you will, when it comes to legislation about camping um, for emergency service, like emergency needs. We're trying to be proactive about that. Think about it in sort of a holistic way in the city itself and get feedback from the elected bodies. So again, if, if that's something you don't want to recommend to council and taking these things off the list, you're right. It does sort of go back to a ad hoc response. I don't know if I, I mean, if you, if you have a policy in place without a, a map of, of, you know, territory, um, I don't know that it necessarily reverts back to, you know, the status quo. I mean, at least you would have a policy of, of how staff should intervene. And, and, you know, I mean, maybe there are a few, you know, maybe identifying schools and, and within a certain distance of, of someone's property. I mean, maybe there are some that make sense, but then identifying parcels of, of city land or potentially state land, maybe we should just leave that off and, and sort of take a first step and then, you know, see what happens. Um, and if people go to state land, I mean, yeah, we're not going to encourage it, but you know, that's that. And, and the state can, you know, in the state, I mean, this is an area that the state should really be taking action on anyway. So if, if it bothers the state, then maybe they can do something about it. Um, you know, unless someone is obviously is, you know, putting public safety at risk, then the city should get involved. But, um, you know, maybe, maybe the good first step is to just enact the policy, leave out the, the territory and, um, and then see what it, you know, see what happens after three months. Thank you. Um, Alec, I would be curious. Um, I know Patrick shared the ownership of the Gateway Park space. Um, and I'm curious to hear from you about management of this. My understanding was that the U.S. Park staff were essentially managing that space. I'm wondering if there's a distinction in your mind between the city Gateway Park land and the state Gateway Park land or how that is works functionally. Uh, I, uh, since I think I've set foot in Gateway Park uh, maybe once or twice in my eight years here. Patrick manages the space and uh, it's on the city website as a, as a park, but really is not under our purview at all. I wonder if we should remove it from the city website as a park, but maybe that's a conversation for another day. Um, so, um, we've got ourselves in a little bit of a pickle here. We have crossed every park off our list, which is essentially the status quo, no camping in any parks in the city of Montpelier. Um, so, um, as Cameron pointed out, there are two tracks here. One is just staff response to people camping, no matter where that is in the city, whether it's in the cemetery or Hubbard or whatnot, and that's happening now. Um, and the other piece is a, a, essentially a map or guidelines that would be more appropriate, I guess. Um, my question is that, I think Dan, you were kind of suggesting that like, maybe there is not, there are not locations or you know, X feet from waterways or X distance from trails or all those things that were in the original kind of policy. Um, but just focusing on that city response, I guess I'm wondering like with the non-intervention piece, I think there are times when somebody would be camping in an inappropriate location that perhaps without those boundaries drawn, would just be clear like this is maybe not a good place for camping what would the city response then be 
in terms of steering people to a better location? How would the city know what is a better location? Um, or does that further non-intervention in the sense that like, well, if every saying that nowhere is off limits essentially says everywhere is within bound, you know, is okay. Um, how does that affect the city response? I don't know if that's an Alec question or a or not. No, I mean, that's a real question. I'm trying to figure out like if somebody, you know, right. So, so my, my thought was that if tonight as a commission, we say, well, like, you know, all the parks are off the table except Confluence and Gateway. And you find somebody camping in Hubbard the city response as I read it was, you know, essentially like, hey, this might be, this isn't a great place to camp. There are better places to be. Can I, here are some services, here's some support. Also, could you pick up your things and move down to Gateway or could you move down to Confluence? And I guess what I'm wondering is that in that same scenario, if we have an established like Gateway or Confluence, for example, as an appropriate place, then does that mean that that same conversation in Hubbard, you have the conversation and say, well, this is not an appropriate place to camp. Here are some services, but you may as well just keep camping here because we have no other place to guide you to. I think that's something that if we don't put boundaries around, we're going to run into as staff and that will be part of that coming back to y'all and telling you how it's going. Right. So it also so also all of these things hinge on the biggest issue is is there shelter available. Right. And so I don't know if I can adequately answer that question for you right now, because that was the that's sort of the question we were trying to answer. Right. With this policy. And if we've taken all of these things off the list, what remains is Dog River and the outskirts of our cemetery. So that gets that gets to a whole other host of issues where folks who are emergency camping are people who may not want to be around other people. The city does not have the resources to provide um, much of anything other than support right now. So where does that leave us? And that was the question we were trying to answer. And I'm not sure um, other than our uh, ordinances that we have now, which you know, we were trying to be proactive about addressing their uh, impending potential irrelevance. We wanted to get ahead of that. And so we still have ordinances on the books. And we can still ask people to move based on those ordinances. And um, I, don't, I don't know if I can get into a further answer with that. Because that's the, that's the problem we're facing. Yeah, and I would just say, I mean, we have the ordinance that has a, a parks curfew. So if we don't take any action, I mean, that's, that's the policy. I and mean, it's just a matter of how does the, you know, how does the city react to that? And, and Cameron has said that, you know, it's really up in the air and it depends on a lot of factors. And so, you know, I, I think we're in a tight place here in that we've, we've removed all the parks from consideration. Um, so there's really not a next step. Um, there's already a curfew for all these parks. So the curfew stands. And we hope, you know, in some cases where maybe a waterway is at risk or, or someone's trashing a campsite that, you know, the police department would, or wh whoever would be uh, charged with working with people to either move somewhere else or, or move off site completely, you know, we would hope that they would work with the park staff to identify the, the most at-risk places where people might camp because they're going to. Could I, could I weigh in just with, um, you know, some thoughts based on experience of finding ourselves back at the status quo? Um, we've historically used a light touch, you know, or maybe a humane touch, I would say, um, rather than just say enforcing the ordinances and you know hauling people off for being there without curfew we um 
try to connect them to services, you know, try to find out what's going on, try to find out if they have contacts, you know, that they can utilize to find a better place. Um, and this policy is really an improvement upon that because now it gets the parks and the cemetery and the police and the social worker and uh, Washington County Mental Health and everybody really on the same page. Um, so you have somebody camping in the parks while well, the ordinance says no camping. Now we have sort of a whole team of people that is working to get these folks to a better solution because, you know, frankly, camping in the park is just not, I don't think it's going to be something that somebody is going to like long term anyway. Anyway, I mean, there's people chomping through there all the time and dogs and um, everyone's in, up in their business. Um, so I feel like that approach will sort of help move the vast majority of folks on to a better solution. And then we might find ourselves caught in a corner case with people, who knows, we might not, but let's say we do, you know, that's when we come back and we put our heads together as a team and say, hey, there's this person camped at this place and they just are unwilling to move and they don't have another solution. Um, and I feel like we're, we're at a scale at this point where we could kind of work together with the services that exist to find a solution for them rather than just enforce the ordinance in a sort of inhumane way and then find ourselves in trouble with the law or with ACLU. Thank you, Alex. Um, so if that is the approach, I'm wondering if our, um, you know, if in fact, essentially all parks are crossed off the list and we're back to the status quo of no camping, then the only space that the city will would be, you know, thinking through then would be the staff response. And so I'm wondering if as a parks commission, it would make sense for us to outline improvements that we could recommend to the staff response piece that would help to you know, mitigate damage to the parks. Is that a helpful space for this conversation? Cameron, maybe? Well, it, I think it depends on, on what, on what the, the ask is. What are you asking my staff to do or provide? Um, well, we talked about fire earlier, and I'm not sure that's referenced in the policy. I mean, I, I think that fire is already. Um, that, that's an ordinance. Yeah, that's very advanced. And okay. that is part of the, the illegal activity, but I'll make sure that it highlights and says the word fire in there. Um, waste management, uh, if I can jump in here is on my mind, so handing out trowels or wag bags or, you know, pointing people towards the outhouses that are established to be part of the response. Um, and actually, I wonder along those lines, Lincoln, if, um, um, you know, showing people where like a map of where there are public restrooms available not just in the parks but in the city i mean i think that might be a useful resource for people we have a few of those definitely working on updating that so thank you um and i think there was already um proposed um uh like where there are encampments found i think cameron in the policy that um, as I remember it, it had now to, to that trash bags or receptacles or something would be provided when possible. I think it says something along those lines. What would that look like in practice? Um, we've been throwing around a couple different ideas about the cheaper to procure cardboard boxes. Have you all seen those at events where people pop up, they stand up trash cans? Mm -hmm. um, and trash bags. It's not a lot more we can provide there. Um, 
I wonder, I mean, this is more of a solution if there were like a more identified location rather than dispersed camps situation. But, um, you know, I think bear bins or something like that. I think for us, Stephanie brought this up last time, but like the wildlife concern, I think is, I think a big deal for us. Um, if you think about, you know, trash that's not stored properly or food that's not stored properly, that's a pretty easy wildlife attractant um, that will result in dead, you know, people will have to kill bears and things like that just once they get into people's food or, or trash. Um, so I'm trying to think if there's a way to um, mitigate that because cardboard boxes and trash bags are not, I mean, you can collect trash, but they're not going to prevent wildlife from getting into trash. Um, we can talk about that as staff and figure out. So thank you. We'll, I'll take that suggestion back. I mean, all of these, I'm, I'm not. Um, and then um, is there, are there um, any recommendations that we would have around temporal considerations or time? You know, Dan, I think the policy that you had proposed last time, you know, was through October 31st, I want to say, or I think October 31st. Um, and I'm wondering from a, you know, management perspective, if there are different considerations in the winter months or, you know, mud season or those types of things that maybe we're not necessarily thinking of in the, in the middle of the summer, although it feels like fall already. So <laughs> I don't know. Um, Dan, you look like you want to say something. Well, I, I mean, the, the city's policy reads like it's it's a permanent policy. And then I drafted our piece as, as temporary so that we could, you know, weigh what the impacts to the parks are through October 31st. But given that we're not including any park space, um, you know, I, I mean, I think it's up to the city what they do. And I don't, I don't, I wouldn't be in favor of, I mean, I, I would like to say, you know, if you see city land getting trashed, then let's review, you know, what's going wrong and, and where we can make a change. But I don't, I don't think I would ask the city to say, you know, hey, you should, you should end this policy on October 31st unless, you know, it's going great. Um, I, I think that was, I had just drafted that specifically for us. Right, our policy would be up for revision. The staff response part of it anyway would be up for revision anytime the staff says, hey, this isn't working. Well, here's why it's not working. And how can we problem solve? And this will not be a one-time conversation for sure. This isn't a thing that's gonna go on a shelf and disappear. This is a, a thing that we're dealing with on a daily basis, You know, not huge numbers, but on a daily basis. And so staff is gonna be able to, to report back how this is going. And we will be able to communicate how this is going to the community. If this is only ends up being a staff response policy, does is city council involved with that at all? Or is that simply a management, you know, staff management practice or something? Well, the staff part of it would be internal. However, because this is a big issue. I, I don't think that the first part of, that's political in any way is going to go away, right? Uh, I think Dan said it earlier, there are schools to be considered um, on the paths in emergency egress locations that would be very difficult to, to take off a list of high sensitivity areas. Right? So, so those are, those are up for debate, up for public comment. All of this is, I want to hear from the public. I want to hear what they have to say about the staff policy and how could we make it better. Um, this is very important to us. I wouldn't have thought of bear bins, right? So now I get to, to bring that back to staff and have a conversation about it, right? And how do we, how do we problem solve around these suggestions? 
So they're still a big, um, a big part of this. And so, so then I guess um, following that then, if there would still be a list of high sensitivity areas, as I read the list now, um, or the, you know, the last version that I saw, the high sensitivity areas were pretty much all human concern, you know, like, like you say, near schools or bridges or, high, you know, high, high, basically high use areas, ball fields, things like that. There were very, there, I think there was one bullet that said, you know, not near waterways and, and wetlands. Um, and I guess my concern then would be like, if there's a list of high ses sensitivity areas that does not include natural resources, are we then missing the boat to influence that high sensitivity area? And so I guess I'm wondering if we need to go back to say, you know, waterways, um, the like special plant communities. Well, what I'm hearing you know, is that's, I, that you would like to add all of the parks to that high sensitivity area list is what I'm hearing from your conversation. Am I understanding that correctly? And that the ordinance applies and y'all's parks would be high sensitivity areas? That's a really interesting interpretation, Cameron, and I think might be very helpful to the situation. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think, I mean, if, if a place like Gateway Park was sort of ours to... I don't know, dole out for lack of a better way of saying it, then, you know, there would be a park on the table, but given that we, you know, it's state land and we can't appear to encourage camping on state land, then, you know, it, it appears that we just want all parks to be, you know, included in this list of, of sensitive areas. Or I, is it, I, is I, it I, enough I worry to... that what's going to get lost in all of this is that, you know, the Parks Commission is just saying, no, we don't, you know, we want to hold our parks aside because, you know, there are parks and, and we have oversight and, and there are all these different concerns. And I, I think it would miss the fact that, you know, we've had multiple conversations that I think have been, I mean, I've been frustrated, but I, you know, I'm not going to say that they haven't been valuable um, conversations about, you know, how our parks should be utilized and, and you know, the the weighing the balance of of these sort of very human concerns with these very you know um non-human natural resource concerns and and you know you go back the past 200 years we've ignored those and now we're sort of trying to uh pick those up and say yeah we're worried about our our waterways and our plant life and 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 our animal life and how do we how do we balance that against the very real human concerns that aren't going away. Um, and, and I think it would, you know, just saying we want the parks to be, you know, lumped into this category of um, restricted spaces. It, it misses that. And I don't know how to get around it. I guess there's probably not a good way, but um, that's what I'm concerned about. And I'm, I'm concerned that that's what, you know, city council would pick up and that's what um, other folks would pick up. Is it enough to just say that, you know, park ordinances apply and not specifically call them out as a high sensitivity area. Um, that might be a little softer of an approach. And I mean, there's no way we can say, you know, sensitive plant communities, how are we gonna <laughs> tend to let people know where those are? Um, so I don't know if we can get much more granular than they already have gotten in the policy. So you're saying rather than adding parks to the list, you would just leave it sort of unsaid, but the- Well, the have, have a line in there just that, you know, current park ordinances apply. I think, um, and that's where we were last time we met, right? Is like, how do, how do you ever convey and communicate? You can't be like 50 feet from water and 25 feet from a trail and a hundred feet from here. And, you know, it's, you just, there's no way to communicate that. And the difference between public and private and state boundaries. Um, but I think that the, the, the crux of this conversation, like when we talk about things that as managers of our parks that we are concerned about, comes back to the sensitivity of the areas. 
you know, like where we're we basically like what we've said is that our parks are sensitive areas. They have elements that we are afraid that this would damage. And so I, I, I'm, I, I kind of think that listing all the parks as high sensitivity areas calls it what it is, which is these are areas that are highly sensitive that would be, you know, reduced, you know, diminished by the, you know, allowing camping in these places. So to me, it seems like listing our parks is like a pretty, you know, it, it clear in some ways clarifies the situation. Like we've talked about it and said, are these sensitive or not? And it seems like what we keep cir circling back to is yes, they are sensitive. Put them on the list. Can we say something along the lines of, you know, we consider all of the parks, you know, sensitive areas where local park ordinances should be followed, particularly, you know, North Branch Park and uh, Hubbard Park and not list all of the parks so that we are leaving some, um, I guess a little leeway. Lincoln, what are your thoughts? <laughs> um, <clears throat> Yeah, I guess I'm thinking like, I feel like this just begs the question of like, what, what would the policy or the enforcement, you know, for city staff look like that would be much different than now, I guess. And I'm thinking about, yeah, Alex's comment about kind of trying to connect, um, you know, get on the same page with, with the city and, you know, local services. Like that sounds good to me. And I'm just trying to like think about how, yeah, we can focus on that instead of sort of like going around in circles. Cause I mean, it does feel clear that, you know, commission, you know, we don't really feel like the parks are the best place, but then if we can somehow like steer the conversation towards the, um, yeah, the response and what we can do doing that realm. Cause the camping is happening, you know, it's going to continue to happen. So yeah, I guess I'm more interested in like, yeah, how do we protect the park resources and how do we get the folks who are out there connected with the resources that they need um, to stay safe out there and then also to you know move move along from an emergency camping situation so you know what the what is said about camping in or out of the parks in the sensitive areas to me i feel like we're that right now it's just a stumbling block that yeah maybe, maybe we can like <laughs> Move, move forward with, like, we know what we, we don't want, right, is camping in the parks. So maybe we can leave it at that and look at the other, other things we do want to be moving forward with. Yeah, I guess it's just a question of how much, how much goes unsaid and how much is explicitly stated. It's just saying that, you know, we are following current park ordinances enough or do we need to explicitly call out our parks as places that are not suitable for camping? Um, so where do we find ourselves? <laughs> um, we have, um, as far as I can tell right now, no parks commission generated policy. Um, we have a few recommendations that the staff as you know part of the staff manage or the staff response would provide information to clarify that fires are banned education about human waste management um solutions to address address trash possibly bear boxes um and no temporal restrictions aside from you know staff monitoring and bringing things up um, and that the high sensitivity areas would be, you know, that all ordinances currently apply and that there's no, which, you know, is in fact that there's no camping in the parks without listing all of the parks. 
Um, did I miss anything? Are there other, you know, the, um, one of the, the, you know, the issue about vegetation, I don't know if there's a way that we can really address that other than like the no fire thing. Um, do we have any action that we need to in fact take as a commission or simply like, you know, Cameron took notes and she'll pass this information along. I would be happy to, you know, if there's another member of the commission that wants to work with me, you know, remotely, cause I'm, I'm not in town, but I'm, I'm happy to write a letter to the city council to sort of lay out our, our thought process on this and then sort of, you know, create this bullet list of things that we are concerned about as the city moves forward the policy, but then to ultimately say, you know, at this time, we don't wish to add any parks to this list of, of sort of non-intervention places and, and, you know, maybe list our rationale. I'm happy to, you know, take a first stab at that. I, I would like for somebody else to look at it. Um, you know, I, I think even given that I have strong feelings on this, I, you know, I think I can say it in a way that would reflect hopefully what we're thinking. And so if there's one other person, um, or if we want to look at it as a commission, I mean, that's, that's fine too. It maybe would be better um, to allow for public input. I do know, when is the city council? I think the city council meets just after our next scheduled meeting. So there might be a chance yeah. to look at this um, in our next meeting and I'm happy to work on it before then. Yeah, our next scheduled meeting would be August 17th, which is the Tuesday before city council meets to discuss on August 18th. Um, so I think that would be great, Dan, if you want to draft that and then we can just review it on the 17th. I see Cameron, you've raised your oh, hand. Yeah. So, um, just for timing purposes, would that letter include anything that you didn't just talk about just so that I know how to edit the document that I, cause I, you know, it'd be, it'd be very difficult to turn around something and, and I can't turn around something in 24 hours for them to look at. I don't think it would be my intent at this time to add anything new. I mean, if something came okay. up at our meeting that, you know, if, if some member of the public or if a parks commissioner or let's say somebody from BRC said, hey, we have this concern as well. Um, and then we debated it and, and decided, hey, we should add it. You know, that might come up. But um, at this time, the way I would draft it would be would be to reflect, you know, what we sort of have gone over the past three meetings. Perfect. Thank you. Um. Any other thoughts from commissioners or else then I was thought I would open it up to the public to see uh, what other folks here have thoughts. Jay, I see your hand, just one second. Anybody, Lincoln, Stephanie, Dan? Okay, Jay, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks everyone. And I've mostly been just kind of listening to hear about, you know, you're thinking about how to approach um, you know, the, the Parks Commission's recommendation to the council about what to do around this ordinance. I, I do want to remind you that um, you don't need reminded because you know this, but you are elected um, and that carries a bit, of, that carries authority with you. And so the council will, you know, you haven't just been appointed, the, the council will hear you as elected officials in terms of recommendations that you make around, you know, for our parks and how those how those recommendations um, might you know impact the decision on how we move forward with this ordinance. So um, I you know I'm, I'm listening mostly listening tonight, but also hearing just sort of maybe like how, what's the best best way to move forward. And I just want to just I hear you. The council will hear you. Your elected officials and we you know we we you know, that carries some authority in terms of how we make decisions around our, you know, we manage the parks in the city. So I just um, appreciate the conversation that I've heard so far um, and um, trying to, the fact that you've all taken, I feel like a really broader view around this issue. I mean, certainly homelessness is a significant issue that we need to deal with um, in the city and, but, you know, how the parks fit in and how this camping policy fits in is only one piece of that very complicated equation. So I just appreciate the conversation. And like I said, I want to remind you that we um, really hear you and respect the, you know, the, the opinion that you, you know, and, and your recommendations that you would bring to us moving forward. So 
I'm happy to answer any questions, but I just wanted to, you know, kind of make that point because I think it's significant. I appreciate that, Jay. I guess I'm I'm curious as a city councilor in your mind how you hear, I think this last kind of point or nuance of where this landed is the question of like, do we list all of our parks in the high sensitivity areas or do we say like, you know, the no camping ordinance applies, you know, which is kind of like a, effectively it's the same thing, but it's worded differently. Like does one or the other uh, mean something different to the city council or in terms of our recommendation? Well, I, I mean, I, I think obviously one of our biggest challenges with this whole process is um, enforcement, right? So the Parks Commission can say like, all right, you, we'll allow camping in the parks, but it can't be in wetlands. It can't be within 200 feet of a river. It can't be in these certain sensitive areas. And how, how are we going to enforce that? So to me, that's sort of, you know, that's kind of the rub or like that that's our challenge here like do, do you decide to just say hey like you know what we because this can't be enforced we need to just say it just can't happen in parks um or is there some nuance that could be written into it and i, I don't have an answer for that but to me that feels like a a huge challenge so Anyways, it's not necessarily a, a specific answer, but I think that that, um, you know, I, I feel like that, that that's going to be a conversation that the council is going to have to have. If, if you came to us with a recommendation that had a lot of really nuanced specific recommendations or um, restrictions rather, then the question will be, was, well, how are we going to enforce that? How is the parks department going to enforce it? Or is it going to be the police department? How do, how do we make that work? Thanks. Um, any other um, comments or, or, or feedback or thoughts from the public based on kind of where we are right now as, as a commission? Yes. Uh, I, I'm sorely disappointed because uh, I thought at prior two meetings that y'all were going to be on a creative track. Uh, as I said, I worked to get the homelessness task force created a couple of years ago. They have failed miserably in two years to wrestle with any of the issues of storage lockers, camping uh, facilities for showers and toilets. So when y'all were talking about acknowledging that you don't have under the Boise case, you don't really have the, the authority to uh, enforce an ordinance, even a, a curfew ordinance or a camping on public land ordinance uh, that y'all were going to get creative and say, we'll bargain with the city. You provide some toilets and trailers for showers and we'll work with making these folks not feel like they're just pariahs unwanted anywhere. But I also want to point out that you're you're really lacking, you've undermined your own credibility by not addressing the ongoing problem of defecation, urination and trash in the Confluence Park and Girton Park over the last, you know, years. So I've been, you know, trying to get the city and public works and parks to address that and to for not. It's, it's gone not power washed, the feces, the urine, the vomit, et cetera, uh, month after month. And that was something that was within your control. While you can sit there and watch these folks cut through the gap in the fence and shit right on the riverbank, and you do nothing about it. So uh, I think the solution is some designated camping uh, of various sorts for those who need a little more privacy and can get further away, but that, that they're still walking distance to facilities. Uh, and rigorous uh, litter pickup. And basically, you want to worry about sensitive, you know, plants. And what about worried about sensitive people? You know, they weren't just released from the hotels. They were kicked out of the hotels. They're not inmates. You know, we're, we're dealing with humans here. We're dealing with the eviction moratorium ending, you know, last night or the night before, you know. 
So either you're part of the solution or you're part of the problem. And I, I regret to think that you've, you've landed on the latter side here. Uh, I don't think you'll be able to enforce nor will it hold up in court that people can't camp in the parks or in, on the riverbanks, et cetera. But the, the problem is it's not as simple as saying, we'll get you some services. There, there is no shelter space. There's no shelter in Montpelier. The shelter in Barrie is about to cram 16 more beds in a bedroom. You know, I've just talked to somebody who's staying there this morning. So that it, during a pandemic is absolute insanity. So if, if they're going to try to say, oh, there's a bed, 16th of a room, you know, and that's not going to hold up in court either if somebody wants to go have the fireplaces as their campsite. So I'm warning you, I'm inviting you to be part of the solution. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Um, Jeff, I saw that you joined us um, and um, Patrick, um, it's, it's been a little while since you've shared. I didn't know if either of you had additional public comments since I can't see you. Um, no, I don't have any more public comment. I just wanted to let you know about Gateway Park. Thank you. I appreciate it. We had no idea. <laughs> Jeff, good to see you. Hi. Yeah, let's see. Um, just, uh, I have a lot of thoughts, but I think I'll only make two brief comments. And one thing that I, you know, I don't know if I missed because I'm afraid I didn't make the whole conversation was is that I'm aware of my years in the parks that there's a lot of people who depend on the parks for their mental health, that they come there and feel safe. And um, I think doing what it takes to protect that park being a safe place for all people is, is really important. And I know, uh, I know a, a large percent of homeless folks are safe. It's just when, when, when doubt is raised, there's a certain percentage that are struggling and have such serious issues that it brings safety into question so that it's a slippery slope. Um, but uh, on the other hand, I think working with the city to find a new place that could be used um, could be used as a, a, a camping place that after the crisis is over, it could be then be turned into a park, could be a win-win a, a situation. That's, that's the short story. And, uh, and I have a couple places in mind that, that might work and be happy to talk with a, a group that's looking into that. And actually I've been meeting with a, a group with another way about kind of generating those kind of ideas and uh, and trying to yeah trying to find a resource in Montpelier. In other words, there's a whole group of people are meeting like uh, well tomorrow night Tuesday night to to work on that kind of an effort. So that's Thanks, the short story. Yeah, my pleasure. Good luck. It's a tough issue. I know you all know both things are important. I'll just in the saying, but. Uh, yeah, you're in, you're in a challenging place. Um, all right. Um, well, um, let's turn back um, to commissioners in light of the um, hearing from Jay and Stephen and Jeff. Um, is there anything about where we have just been prior to the public comment that we want to address or respond to or shift it all in light of public comment? That was my pause for introverts. <laughs> Didn't hear anything okay oh here comes dan i have food in my mouth so i'll try to but i, I think in response that was to, a for introverts dan 
<laughs> just I don't know. I talk way too much. <laughs> um, I think in response to what Steve said about you know the the waste along the river, um, you know, it, it, if that's an issue, and, and I mean, I run through there, but I don't spend a whole lot of time. And I don't know if you know park staff is able to spend a whole lot of time, but if that's an issue, I think it's something we should discuss. Um, you know, apart from the encampment thing, you know, especially we we have heard about Girton Park in the past. I had concerns about whether we actually had jurisdiction over that space, and it sounds like we do. So I, I mean, um, I think we should have a conversation, you know, as soon as possible about you know how do we how do we reduce the amount of human waste that's left on those parcels? Whether you know we put porta potties somewhere nearby where it's not, you know, so close to the river that we're running afoul of, of state policies, but you know, a place where people could realistically use them, or if there are other things we could do. Um, I'd love to have that conversation. Um, I just want to jump in because at the last city council meeting, um, they voted to move Girton Park structure from its current location to the 16 or 12 main street location which is currently the grassy lot there next to the bike path beside the drawing board um that's not correct so, yeah just a real cl clarification, real clarification for the record here so you remember um i, I think alec had talked about it with y'all the parks um grant that we had tried to get for the 12 main lot to make that more of a downtown park yeah so Council had approved that grant twice, um, and part of that grant application was to move this, just the structure of the Girton Park gazebo to 12 Main and add a bunch of other park um, facilities there. And uh, we didn't get either grants, but because council had approved through that grant process, the movement, we're gonna go ahead and do that. Um, so that should be moved on the ninth, right? Yeah, next, next week is the plan to move it. And it's part of a, yeah, like Cameron said, part of an effort to make that 12, is it 12 or 16? We, we keep remember. changing it, the 12, <laughs> 16, man. To make it uh, a better space for the public use, yeah. Well, I guess that, you know, that begs the question for me of, if we move it, does does the same crowd follow, the same issues follow? And, and, and I don't know, and, you know, and maybe none of us knows, but, you know, are there, are there actions that we can take to maybe mitigate some of the, the risk of, you know, a, a takeover by a certain number of people or, or waste or any number of sort of negative outcomes or not, I don't know, uh, adverse outcomes. And so, it, you know, to me, it's a useful conversation of um, how do, you know, we, we have opportunities with this space near the river, near the bike path. Um, how do we utilize that space properly without consequences i actually i was biking by there this morning um you know past jaws and and down main street and um kind of thinking about this issue and i i actually think that the the best mitigation is almost exactly what cameron just talked about which is further developing the site for to meet its full potential i mean not just 12 main but right beyond there like between the um you know, the parking lot and the river and the footbridge, there are all these, you know, just plants and invasives and weeds kind of growing up. Like that could be a, a beautiful garden where you can look across the garden and see the Capitol Dome as you enter the town. And it could actually be a, a quote unquote gateway park for, you know, people welcoming people to the city. And I think that if we can go through with um, proactive things of whether it's children's play structures or, um, you know, garden, things that would actually make more people want to use and stay and be in that space, the increased use for, I think it's intended purpose, which actually result in decreased use for unintended purposes. Um, and so I think that's a kind of proactive investment that we can make in, in the future of these places that I think would have a, make a big difference. Um, but I think all of that is a conversation for perhaps another day. Um, are we um, at this point, as I understand it, um, there's not necessarily any 
action or motion or vote that we all need to take. We have, um, you know, shared our conversation and concerns and, and suggestions with Cameron. She's taken notes. Dan is going to draft a, um, a letter to city council kind of outlining our conversation and how we got to where we are and what our concerns are and, and recommendations. Um, and then city council would move forward. Um, does that sound right? Am I missing anything? Okay. Um, well, with that, um, I will, um, let's go ahead and get a, a, a motion to adjourn. All right, do we have a second? I'll second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? All right, we are adjourned at 718. Thank you everyone. Our next meeting is our regularly scheduled meeting, which is the third Tuesday of every month at 6 p.m. Um, so that would put us on Tuesday, August 17th at 6 p.m. See y'all then.